Welcome back, my friends. Currently, we're on day 201 of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. And when we actually look at the map of how much territory that the Ukrainian forces have successfully retaken, it comes out to be over 8,000 square kilometers. So as exciting as this rapid advance has been over the last week by the Ukrainian forces, I think at this point it is going to start slowing down because the Ukrainian military needs to properly digest all of this territory. There's lots of Ukrainian civilians that need the military's help. There are thousands of Russian prisoners of war who have to be guarded and transported west. And there's lots of Russian military equipment that needs to be inventoried and then redistributed to Ukrainian forces elsewhere. So as exciting as the last week has been, I think it is going to slow down in the coming week. But when we go on deepstatemap.live, this is still pretty satisfying to look at. And it's quite clear what the Russians want. The Russians wanted to retreat back to their own borders, not have the Ukrainians follow them. And they wanted to get to the east side of the Oskil River and have this be the new front line. Now, there is reports that Ukrainians have crossed the river to get a beachhead on this side. They're not going to let the Russians have this be a nice barrier. And you can see that what the Ukrainians really want is this road right here, this road leading directly to Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. In addition, if they can get control of this road, any Russian forces down here will become completely surrounded, and it'll be another bad situation for the Russians. So in retrospect, over the last two weeks or the last three months, what the heck happened? And uh, Ukraine is now claiming that Ukraine's southern offensive in the Kherson region was designed to trick Russia. This is pretty interesting. The much-publicized Ukrainian southern offensive in the Kherson region was a disinformation campaign to distract Russia from the real one being prepared in the Kharkiv region. This is according to Ukraine's special forces. And if this is true, then they fooled me, because logically this made the most sense to attack first, because the Russians have the most difficulty holding and resupplying the north bank of this river. So back in June, potentially, President Zelensky announced this Kherson southern counteroffensive to retake the North Bank. Then, at this point, Russia stopped attacking in the Donbass, and they spent months uh, fortifying and rushing in soldiers, rushing in equipment in order to hold this, uh, this wedge of land. Sure enough, two weeks ago, Ukraine makes a lot of noise saying that the Kherson counteroffensive in the south has begun. Doesn't look like they made a lot of progress that week, but exactly one week later, uh, the counteroffensive in the Kharkiv region kicked off. Russia was caught off guard. They didn't have the proper equipment, the proper supports, their best soldiers in this region, and the Kharkiv uh, region for the Russian forces just completely collapsed. Now, am I giving up on of the Ukrainians retaking the north bank of this river, and I'm not. I still think that over the coming weeks or months, there will be another collapse of the Russian forces, and Ukraine will sweep through and take everything on the north side of this river. There's still probably about 20,000 Russian soldiers. I guess these are the good ones, uh, sticking it out and fighting. But as they're living under constant shelling and constant bombing, once again, in the coming weeks, I think they'll either be captured, killed, or voluntarily choose to flee to the south side of the river. But if they do retreat, they're not taking any of their equipment with them, all of the ferries, all of the bridges, everything that uh, Russia needs to get across this river, the Ukrainians keep blowing up. So what is the Russian military's response to their military ineptitude, their military blunders? And they chose yesterday to fire 12 cruise missiles worth about $100 million to shut down the electricity in four of Ukraine's regions. Here's a statement from President Zelensky. 
a total blackout in the Kharkiv and Donetsk regions, a partial one in Zaporizhia, the Dnipro, Petrovsky, and Sumy regions. The Russian terrorists remain terrorists, and they choose to attack critical civilian infrastructure. No military targets, no military facilities at these civilian power plants. The goal of the Russian military was to deprive civilians of light and heat. So there's lots of pictures and videos on social media of the blackout. It did last several hours until power could be re restored. So here we are, total blackout in Kharkiv. Also no water supply because the pumps uh, that pump the water need electricity to operate. And thankfully, Russia didn't choose to blow up nuclear power plants. They instead targeted thermal ones, coal and natural gas. But still, this is, this is still very uh, irresponsible and dangerous. At this point, is there any doubt that Russia is a terrorist nation deliberately committing war crimes because their own military is incompetent? A moment of a missile hitting the power plants was actually captured on camera. I'm not going to play it for you because I don't want to get in trouble with YouTube, but I'll link it down below, as always, if you ever want to see any of these full videos. So the Russian army, it's estimated now, is losing on average one battalion tactical group worth of equipment and men every day as Ukraine continues their counterattacks. The Russian army is losing at least a battalion's worth of vehicles and men a day uh, as a response to the twin Ukrainian counteroffensives. That's a pretty cool phrase. Uh, I think the Ukrainians should start talking about twin, twin counteroffensives. And it's absolutely incredible that I think I've gone almost a week on my channel without mentioning a HIMARS strike, but that doesn't mean that the HIMARS aren't still launching on Russian positions. Here's a video of a Russian convoy that was on its way to help the Russian soldiers in Izium in the Kharkiv region, and Ukraine knew about it. They knew where they were going to be, and they successfully took them out with some HIMARS uh, missiles. Additionally, ammunition depots in the middle of the night continue to blow up. Here is one in the Kokovka region that was hit probably by HIMARS. The secondary explosions uh, were going off for five or six hours after the initial strike. And I cannot underestimate to you or for you, uh, when we talk about game-changing weapons, uh, yes, the Bayraktar drone, yes, the Javelins and the Enlaws, but nothing has turned the tide of this war more than these uh, M270 and uh, M142 HIMARS launchers. And it's these shorter range GMLS, GMLRS rockets being supplied by the United States and NATO. I do think eventually that the longer range attackums will be supplied, but if Russia somehow collapses politically or economically in the next couple months, uh, maybe they won't get the long range missiles in time. And what I want to emphasize in this video is how devastating these HIMARS missiles have been. When they were introduced two months ago, that is when the Russian military lost all of its momentum and it stopped advancing in the Donbass region. And I was reading articles and doing research, and almost two months ago, I made this video. The United States could provide Ukraine with over 10,000 HIMARS missiles. I did some math based on public information. What is the existing United States stockpile of these GMLRS rockets, and uh, realistically, how fast can they get them across the Atlantic Ocean uh, into Ukrainians' hands? And my estimates are that about 1,500 of these GMLRS rockets are being delivered to Ukraine every month and will continue to be delivered through January or February. What that means is that in the last two months, the Russian ground forces in Ukraine have taken and absorbed 3,000 of these precision-guided, uh, very deadly GMLRS rockets. This is their command posts, their fuel warehouses, their ammunition depots, their critical infrastructure to uh, maintain their supply lines. So why, 
why is the Russian ground forces giving up? Why are they just collapsing? And the reason is because of these GMLS rockets blowing everything up. In the last two months, they've taken 3,000 of these things, potentially. And when they report this to high command at the Kremlin, high command in Moscow, they're saying, what are you doing to help us? How can you get rid of these HIMARS systems? We can't advance as long as our ammo depots keep blowing up. And I think Russian high command, I think the Kremlin, has no answer. They have no response. They cannot stop these HIMARS strikes occurring on Russian forces every single night. So the marching orders from the Kremlin over the next four or five months is just take it. Just take another 7,000 of these GMLS rockets. More ammunition depots, more command posts, more, uh, you know basis. I'm speechless that uh, that this isn't being talked about more, that I think the ground forces are mutinying because they don't want to be bombed anymore. They don't want to die. And uh, Russian high command is doing nothing to help their guys. Here is an interesting report uh, that found amongst a Russian commander's items were signed letters from Russian soldiers refusing orders, refusing to fight. So there's a, a stack of papers here. I'll just play. I'll just play a little bit of this for you. Я так розумію, що ця площадка якогось комбата була, бо тут рапорти на ім'я командира батальйону. So this is pretty interesting when a Russian soldier refuses an order, firing on civilians or whatever. The commander wants a signed note saying that they're refusing their order as evidence for a court-martial trial when they return to Russia. However, this Russian commander was captured and these soldiers were either killed or probably captured as well, so I don't think the court-martial in Russia is ever going to happen. Lots of incredible intercepted phone calls from Russian soldiers calling their loved ones in Russia on unsecure lines. Here is a recorded conversation of a Russian soldier who had been stationed in Izium, uh, and this is what he has to say to either his, his wife or his girlfriend. <laughs> 14 числа мне прибавили его еще до 9 октября. Я хуел. Комбат не знаю. Октября. Я тебя очень люблю. Я тебя очень люблю. Я не иду. Всех не вывели. Парней может быть глупый. Тупый дубай пиздец. Зло. Это мрак. Я слышу по новостям. Ты где в каком месте? Изюм? Изюминский район, деревня Копанки. Bloodbaths every day. It's a nightmare here. Get the info out. This Russian soldier is calling his loved one in Russia saying, tell people what is happening here. It's an absolute nightmare. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian military, Ukrainian forces just get stronger every day. The joke on the internet now is that the Russian military is now the largest arms provider to the Ukrainian military. As they fled for their lives in the Kharkiv region, they left behind hundreds of vehicles, lots of tanks and armored equipment, all being immediately repurposed for use by the Ukrainian military. And the Ukrainian farmer... Tractor Brigade, they've been very busy over the last week. Uh, let's just watch this clip together. It's good to see Ukrainian farmers out there helping the Ukrainian military with their tractors. Here's a story from last March that you might have forgot about when the Russians were getting annihilated outside of Kyiv, uh, Ukraine to troll them announced that, this is from Ukrainian tax authorities, 
They said that citizens don't need to declare captured Russian tanks and military equipment for tax purposes. So if you happen to stumble upon an abandoned Russian tank and want to uh, claim it for yourself, you don't have to pay taxes on, on that gain. So here's the joke online. When you're a Ukrainian farmer with a tractor and you're getting paid by the tank. Absolutely incredible footage is being aired on Kremlin State Propaganda TV. This is from the Twitter account Julia Davis, and I feel so sorry for this woman that she has to spend all day just watching Kremlin propaganda and then translating it to English. But this entire clip is seven minutes long. I will, uh, I will link it down below. Well worth watching the entire thing. I'm going to show you two clips of what Russian pundits are now saying about this war on Russian TV. Люди, которые убедили президента Путина, что спецоперация будет эффективной, короткой, по мирному населению бить не будем, только зайдем, Росгвардия, там, кадыровцы все наведут порядок и так далее. Вот эти люди, ну, просто подставили всех нас очень сильно. Но эти люди ну, есть. Ну, конечно, есть. Президент же не сам как бы сидел и думал, дай я начну спецоперацию. Ты приходил, говорил, что украинцы сдадутся, разбегутся, все в Россию попросят. Тот же это ему говорил, что в конце концов, да? Да, да и на телевидении говорили, что не Мы подошли к черте, за которой надо вот просто понимать простую вещь. Победить Украину теми ресурсами, которые сейчас Россия там пытается воевать в режиме колониальной войны, да? Контрактники воюют, там, значит, ЧВК и так далее, мобилизации нет. Да? Риторика, ну, следите. Ну, это невозможно абсолютно, потому что российской армии там противостоит вообще сильная армия, которая по полной программе поддерживает сильнейшее в экономическом, технологическом отношении государство Европы, да, в частности. То есть вы предлагаете Европы. мобилизацию вот. провести, ну, Слушайте, военную вот мобилизацию, сказать, не мобилизацию, там, сознание или... Начать переговоры о прекращении а, войны понятно, и прийти к политическим вопросам. Вы с Николаем Игоревичем вы Сергей Михайлович. Начать переговоры или действовать так, как вот Богдан Анатольевич предлагает? никаких нацистским режимом Зеленского быть не может. Э, нацистский режим Зеленского должен быть уничтожен. Господин Надеждин считает, что у нас... Или мобилизация, этого... или мобилизация, она в полный рост. This man is absolutely correct. Either Russia needs to officially de declare war and mass mobilize their people for war, or they need to just give up and go to the negotiation table, offer for some kind of peace. Because the way that this special limited military operation is going right now, Russia is losing and they know it. Let's now fast forward to 515 and there's one more Russian pundit I want to share with. This, this man right here. Что необходимо еще, чтобы население на местах, люди на местах поддерживали нас, идеологически поддерживали нас. И для этого на освобожденных и не только на освобожденных территориях, для этого необходимо им, с ними, понимаете, рассказывать украинцам, что их не существует как этноса, как народа, что украинского языка не существует, это не может вызвать их симпатию. Эти обстреливают, а мы должны разговаривать. Мне кажется, это какие-то несовершенные. Надо реалистично подходить к тому, к людям, которые там живут, и предлагать, говорить им о том, как выглядит их будущее да, вместе с Россией. Но кем они будут в России? Правильно. Кем они будут себя ощущать, себя чувствовать? Если они считают себя украинцами, то сколько бы им ни говорили, там, Холмогоровы или какие-то еще, понимаете, наши люди, что их не существует, понимаете, говорить человеку, что его нет, отрицать его сам, так, мы сейчас значит, вызвать уходим, его, и не будет. Вызвать его Мне отражение. кажется, что это все э, надо было... That's some pretty radical self-reflection occurring on Russian state TV. Hey, maybe saying that the Ukrainian ethnicity doesn't exist, Ukrainian culture doesn't exist, and that guttural Ukrainian language should never be spoken, maybe that isn't the way to win the hearts and minds of people you're trying to occupy. Uh, there's lots of Russian politicians and pundits on state TV who have openly called for Ukrainian genocide. And we have finally some ref reflection happening here saying, well, maybe that wasn't the best strategy to get the local people to uh, support our occupation of their country. Wow. I'm looking forward to more of those clips. 
More good news is that just a week ago, the Russian ruling party was proposing for a November 4th annexation vote for the occupied territories. So Russia was getting ready to formally, uh, legally annex Ukrainian territory with fake elections, fake votes. But because of this Kharkiv counteroffensive, there's, there's no longer talk of a November election anymore. Moscow's plans to hold referendums on, an, on annexing Ukrainian territories has been put on hold indefinitely. So this is a relief. Nobody was going to recognize these sham elections anyways, but I still think it's important to avoid them altogether to just not give Russian propagandists any more fuel. Let's now wrap up this video with a uh, heartwarming clip of a Ukrainian soldier coming home to visit his family, and this is the reaction of uh, his grandmother seeing him probably for the first time in a couple months. That's all for this update video. Glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support my channel. Any comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.